Brown is the Director of Systems Engineering at 10F, where he helps companies and organizations scale and secure WordPress. In a previous life, Zach got his master's degree in meteorology from North Carolina State University. He lives in Portland, Oregon with his wife and two kids and rides his bike whenever he can. All right, thank you. Get down to the home stretch here today. Made it. All right, so I'm going to talk about caching, which is a topic near and dear to my heart. I've made a career out of knowing what caching is and how to uh, implement it on sites. This is no joke. I literally uh, have made a career on mostly this. Um, the purpose of this talk is to talk in basic terms what caching is so that at the end of it you understand what the terms are, the different layers we can apply caching, how it's important and can help your site, and understand these terms. Uh, so when you're going forward and it comes up, you have some base knowledge on uh, you know, how to look at this, what these mean. You can have an intelligent conversation on it. We're not going to get into super detailed technical uh, stuff or solving specific problems with caching. Uh, when I started putting together this presentation, I was like, oh god, I made a terrible mistake. This is way too broad of a topic. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> Uh, I could do eight hours on this, uh, so I'm trying to distill it into the most important kind of definitions and basic concepts that I think everybody should understand. All right. See if I can make your work. Across 
thousands, tens of thousands of miles, potentially, on cables going under the ocean to the server where your site is hosted at GoDaddy or WP Engine or Bluehost. And that server lives in one, one place. So this is your hosting environment where your site lives. So WordPress receives that URL. And then it's going to run some subset of the 400,000 lines of PHP code that make up WordPress. This is not including plugins or themes. Some subset of that 400,000 lines of code is going to run to figure out where should, what page should be served for this URL. What is this person requesting? How is this page going to look? What data is going to be shown on this page? It makes requests to the database to get the content, all the things you've written, all your data is in the database. That gets returned to WordPress. The HP code runs on this. WordPress builds an HTML page that includes all of the images and CSS and JavaScript and other stuff that goes into making a page. Builds this HTML file, sends all that data back across wires, to a person, to the person sitting at their computer, who is thrilled because they realize how many complicated things had to happen for that site to, to look. So here is how a WordPress site happens. If we think about our definition here <clears throat> about trying to serve something faster, store some computationally expensive thing in a cache that we can refer to quickly. We can think about where we would put this cache so that it would be quicker to serve this site to the user. So what if we put a layer of caching right here? This is called the full page caching. <coughs> this is when you put a layer of caching at the very front of your hosting environment so that when WordPress serves an HTML page to that user, after it has built the entire thing and done those hundreds of database queries and thousands of lines of code, and it has an HTML page, we'll just store that HTML page. And then the next person who asks for that HTML page, we'll just give them that page. We won't have to build everything with WordPress and databases and everything. Now this is great when you have a publishing site, right? Your newspaper, your blog, your marketing site, right? Every page is the same. I get the same page as you get to everybody out in the hall when they request it. Same page. Nothing unique going on here. So there's no reason you have to run all of the code of WordPress and all of that logic to build that page. It's the same page. Just send the HTML to them again. So this cuts out all of this work. This is great because it's super fast. Now we don't have to do all that work. Your website can serve those HTML pages super fast. It's very efficient. You can do this on a really small server uh, with very little resources to serve an HTML page. And it's very scalable. To give you an idea how scalable this makes something, imagine this is the amount of data your website can uh, get served at any given time. It doesn't matter how many people are coming to your website, that hose is only so big, those nozzles are only so big, that's as much water as you can push through that website no matter what you do. There's no more pages coming out of there. That's fine if you have a couple visitors, but you know. What if you write a popular article and lots of people are coming here? Enabling full page caching turns your website from a hose like this to something like this. Like, I, this is no joke. It is hundreds of thousands of times more efficient to serve just HTML pages than running all of WordPress. Uh, I've worked on some large sites where um, they're hosting it across 12, 15 servers, struggling to keep up. Every time they get lots of traffic, the site goes down, uh, it crashes, they can't keep up with it, they're paying tons of money for hosting. Enable very simple full page caching on the site, and it can be served in two or three servers easily without any 
stability problems. It really makes a huge difference uh, in the performance and what your system can do. All right, so those are the benefits of full page caching. Now there are some gotchas to be aware of, and this isn't an exhaustive list, but these are kind of the big ones. So one thing to consider is, okay, I'm saving this request after WordPress has created it. What happens when I publish new content? I change the title of an article because some SEO guy told me I should use a different word. How does that get updated in the cache? There's a, there's a saved version of it. You can change it over here, but how does the cache know now there's a new version? Also, I've changed the title. That, that title is also on my home page, on the archive page, it's in the related posts thing over here. I need that to be updated everywhere. And the second question is what if you have a site that deals with unique content? Like you have a WooCommerce site and people have shopping carts, or you have a WordPress site and people have logged in and they're seeing their specific friend activity list, things like that. So the first one, what happens when there's new content? There's two ways to handle it. You could just wait longer. When we set up the full page cache, the way you do it is you set an expiration time for those pages when they're in the cache, say five minutes or 10 minutes. You can, this is a super simple way to set it up and you can set it up to just be, it expires every 10 minutes and after 10 minutes a new page will be requested for WordPress and then you'll get your updates then. So you just have to wait. And this is fine because this is a very simple thing to do and really, really scalable. But people don't really like this. They, they want to push the button, publish their thing, they want everyone to see it, they want to tweet about it immediately, they don't want it to, to be on a delay. So the other way to do it is you can throw out the old page and refresh it with a new page. Uh, this is what happens when you use a cache system that's integrated with WordPress. Uh, and this can be integrated using any number of WordPress plugins. And the way they work is when you publish a new post, uh, it fires a hook on saving the post to the caching system. The caching system knows all the places that that post uh, is used, and the title or the metadata shows up, and it clears selectively all of those pages from the full page cache, and now you have a new version, and it's available instantly. So this is a pretty well-solved problem. Uh, we have uh, WordPress plugins that do this, so uh, this, is, this is definitely something you can expect uh, when you're working with full page cache will have that kind of intelligent cache clearing. So what if your site deals with unique content for a user? <clears throat> well, it's not, it, no, you can't really use full page caching for this. That's not, it's not gonna work. It really relies on every page being the same uh, that's served. So if you have a, a e-commerce site or BuddyPress or something where the thing served from the server is different for every user that comes to can be different for a user coming to the page, uh, you'll want to look at something different. So in that case, we will remove the full page caching. And there's still something we can take advantage of here. There's object caching, <coughs> which exists right around here. It is a place to store uh, the results of database queries. Uh, or some complicated things that happen in WordPress that you don't necessarily want to have to do um, on every page book. So we generally we use a software tool like Memcache or Redis, uh, and those are key value stores, which is illustrated here. They're just basically really simple databases. They don't have anything fancy going on. It's just there's a key and there's a value. And so we say, well, give me the value, give me the value that's related to key K3, and we we'll spit that out. Give me the value for key K4. This way, rather than MySQL, where it's like, well, give me things in the post meta table for this uh, you know, post ID, you have to join the post meta table with the post table, and only tell me things from October 3rd to October 5th, and things that were written by 
by Julie, that can be very difficult for the database to figure out and apply all those rules. If you had that value in the cache, it would just be sitting somewhere and say, oh, give me the value for K3 and it would spit it out. One place we use object caching a lot is, let's say you have a site that relies on APIs. Uh, we work with a financial site that does financial reviews, <coughs> talking about stock prices. Did they go up or go down? These are your dividend stocks. In their articles, they have, uh, they, when they mention a stock, they like to put the stock ticker name and the current price of that stock. And so that populates all the way through their site uh, in the content. Now, it happens to be fairly expensive to make these calls to this API to get this financial data. So every time you load a page on that site, we don't necessarily want to have to you know, update that Apple ticket price every single page load. So that's going to get very expensive if they have a popular article. And it doesn't need to be updated every second, right? So in the object caching, after the first page load where the Apple, Apple stock price is loaded, we store that value in the object cache. On the next page load, we don't have to make an API call to get that Apple uh, stock price. It's sitting right there in the object cache. So we'll just pull it right from there. When the 15 minutes are up, when that page loads, it'll see that value has expired. We'll make a new call uh, to the API and refresh the cache with that Apple stock price. So this way it saves us money for having to make that API call. And APIs, I don't control these APIs. It could be slow. I don't want this page load getting hung up halfway through waiting for this API to tell me the Apple stock price. If I have it in my object cache, I know I have it somewhere that I can uh, refer to and it's going to serve quickly and reliably uh, and, uh, and load my page and not get in the way. Let's see. So the benefits of this are when you turn it on, it's generally pretty invisible. WordPress works uh, right out of the box with object caching. Um, many popular plugins uh, have good object caching integration. You can kind of turn WordPress caching on, uh, object caching on if you have it, or install a plugin to do it, and everything looks exactly the same. Like, oh, hey, great. I guess that's good. Uh, it does improve scalability. Right at, when you turn it on, it's probably not going to make anything too much faster. But at high scale, if you're doing a lot of complex things, uh, it can really improve the scalability of WordPress. And it can be used for full page caching. There's no reason you can't have both of these things. OK, so back to the publishing sites where we can do full page caching. So that puts us here. So this is great. We're serving items out of the full page cache. We're not doing any of the uh, full work load of WordPress every time. But we still have all those wires to go across. Uh, and that can be sort of slow, especially if you're hosting a site at GoDaddy and we have a server in Dallas and the person trying to read your site is in Australia. That's a long way for that request to go. And even at close to the speed of light, it does take a little while. So what if we did some caching at this layer, much closer to the actual user who's requesting that data? So this is called the Content Delivery Network, or a CDN. A CDN is a global network of servers that you can pay, uh, pay a company to store your data on their servers and serve it to their local customers. On a WordPress site, in general, uh, the kind of entry-level way to do this would be to store your images on the CDN. So those are very large, take a while to download. You store them at a CDN, and they're stored at, on these servers that are globally distributed that you can use uh, to quickly serve, uh, serve that, those images to clients, to people, uh, people browsing the site. So as an illustration of what that looks like, let's say there's a, you have your server in San Francisco, this is where your site is hosted. And here's two people browsing the site, one in New York and one from over Australia. 
of course, the person in Melbourne chose to go the long way around the globe for some reason. <laughs> but you, know, you get the idea. Uh, this happened, this is, there's, it's a big distance. It's a long way away. So if you had a CDN in play here, you would have servers all over the place. And the person in Melbourne would be making a request to a server in Sydney. And the person in New York would be making a request to a server in New York. And you would reduce all that latency of traffic of that request going across all those wires. And there's, you know, some of the big providers here have hundreds of servers around the world, so there's going to be one local uh, to your visitors. So there's two main types of CDNs. There's the origin pool CDN and the reverse proxy CDNs. On an origin pool CDN, you would have your URL www.mysite.com, which is goes to your WordPress site. Then you have a separate domain, such as cdn.mysite.com, that you would point at the CDN's company's servers. You would use a WordPress plugin, generally, to uh, automatically rewrite all the URLs for your images and your CSS or JavaScript files to go to cdn.mysite.com while your main requests uh, for you know, the homepage and stuff still go to www.mysite.com. So when the request goes to cdn.mysite.com, if the CDN has already cached your image, it would just serve it. That would be the end of it. It would happen really quickly. If it's not there, uh, the CDN makes a request back to your main website and pulls that image in, caches it, and serves it to that person so that the next person can get that image. It's really very transparent and it's pretty easy to do. It will make a big difference in how fast these things um, are served. So to, the CDN request goes to right there to the local CDN where mysite.com, as I said, goes across wires and tunnels and under the ocean and through local uh, fiber optic or copper cables and finds the WordPress. So it's a, there's a big difference in what's going on with the request here. The reverse proxy CDN is actually what I see more often and would be what I would recommend using if you were uh, getting started. How this works is that your request to your site, www.mysite.com, goes first to CDN. It doesn't go right to your servers, it goes to the CDN. Works kind of the same way where it serves files, movies, uh, big, you know, audio files, things like that. Uh, but, because all your traffic is going through the CDN, not only can you do this, this layer of caching here, you can apply security rules with the web application firewall. Uh, you can do things like optimize images on the fly. Uh, you can even do full page caching at the CDN on some of these solutions. Uh, now, some of these CDNs are allowing you to run JavaScript code on their servers at the CDN one, which I've seen uh, applied to do really innovative things, things that are changing the content on the page on the fly during the request, uh, specifically like running a paywall. Like, you know, let's say you want people to pay a dollar a month to visit your site that they have to uh, authenticate. You can do that with JavaScript at the CDN before that request ever gets to WordPress. So WordPress doesn't have to know anything about all that, that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, so that's the difference. You don't have to use a separate domain. It sits completely between the browser and your site, which is still behind all these wires way far away. Um, but there's a CDN in between at, at all times where you can apply this caching in different, uh, different level of rules. Okay, so we're back to our diagram here. So we'll change the labels of this to be what it is. We have full page caching, right, as things come out of our hosting environment. And now we have uh, the CDN, uh, caching images and possibly full pages uh, very close to the user. The last kind of caching I'm going to talk about uh, actually happens on your computer in the browser. So this is the best, because now we don't have to make a request to you anywhere. 
uh, to get the benefit of uh, caching. Your browser itself will save these files, which you know that's definitely going to be the fastest way to serve it. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to make a request anywhere else. Your browser already has these files that will just serve them. Um, browser caching can be used for the same kind of things as CDN can be used for, and the mechanics of setting these rules are pretty similar. This we got. This is the WordCamp Seattle uh, page load. I'm just looking at it in the Chrome Inspector tools. The first part of it is the main request to the site, and that actually goes to the server and um, loads from the server. But the rest of these, you can see, says from disk cache, from disk cache, from disk cache. All the rest of the things that load on the page, the images, all that, are serving from my local browser, which means it's super fast. The way this works, the first time you go to the site, uh, these images all load from the server and save in your browser. Now the next time you go to it, your browser already has all these things. It's not loading a new version. It's just loading these uh, from within your browser. You set the rules uh, on this in either Apache or Nginx. There's lots of tutorials uh, about how to do this, uh, how to set up browser caching in a self-hosted environment where you have Apache or that kind of stuff. If you are using a CDN, there's often an interface for setting up those rules in the CDN even um, and overwriting what's coming from your server. Uh, so this is great and there's no reason uh, not to use this. It really does help. So, well, one last thing on this slide. Part of the motivation for this talk uh, is that Google is starting to pay attention to these metrics more and more. And especially this summer, uh, I've seen a lot of clients, a lot of the big clients of ours, uh, really start to be impacted by this. Google's constantly making algorithm changes, and one they made this summer really is uh, starting to focus on web page performance. And you might have seen there's like GT Metrics, uh, there's PageSpeed Insights that's provided by Google. There's lots of PageSpeed tools uh, for measuring your website performance. But Google is also measuring your website performance every time somebody loads your site in Chrome. They're gathering telemetry data about this. So if you're not using best practices with browser caching or CDN, or maybe when you get a lot of traffic and your site is crashing, Google has telemetry data about that and knows how fast it is. It's not just serving the site up for the Google bot to be fast. It's serving it up reliably every day to be fast. And only the fastest sites with good content uh, that are stable and reliably online are going to get ranked high. And if you talk to any SEO consultant, it will say page performance is important. And usually people are like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what do I need to do to make that happen? These are some of the big tools I use every day to, uh, to achieve that goal uh, for sites. All right, so this is the part about how to actually implement some of these uh, recommendations and concepts. So the easiest thing to do is to just use a managed WordPress host. Stop trying to do this on your own and sign up for WPN or Pressable or even some of the lower cost uh, managed WordPress hosts like GoDaddy, DreamHost, you know, Bluehost. If you use a managed WordPress plan and you're not using like cPanel or the absolute cheapest shared hosting, all of the expensive managed shows that I have on the top include full page caching. And most of the ones included on the bottom of this list include caching. This is just a small list. There's SiteGround, there's, it's a gigantic list of managed WordPress hosts out there. So find one you like, find one that has a good uh, pricing that works for you. And you will get built-in caching. Not all of them include it, but most of them do. And it's great when it's built in because the strategy for how it works and how to set it up, you've already kind of figured that out. You just 
down to pay them the money and host your site there, and you will get the benefit of their full page caching and all the systems that they set up. Hosts like Gambia, well, all the hosts on the top have options for integrating a CDN. Gambia, I think all of their plans come with uh, an integrated CDN. They even do full page caching on the CDN level. So this really makes it easy. They also, most of these support object caching, where there's just a button in your dashboard, to turn object caching on and off. Super easy. So this takes care of almost all of your problems. If you are more doing it yourself, like you have a DigitalOcean server, or you're, you're doing this on shared hosting, there's a lot of WordPress plugins that can also make this easy for you. Full page caching is a pretty solved problem. The WP Super Cache plugin is where I recommend people mostly start. It's well supported. Uh, Automatic is supporting it at this point. Uh, it's been around forever, and it works on pretty much any site. If you're using managed hosting, you don't need all of this, but if you're doing it yourself, this is a really easy kind of plugin to get started. For the CDN, Cloudflare and Sakuri both have really nice interfaces. Uh, it's pretty easy to get started with that. <coughs> Once you kind of go through their setup and follow the instructions, you'll have kind of automatically the benefit of both a firewall and um, and CDN caching for your images and things like that. Uh, for browser caching, I think the easiest thing to do is if you're using Cloudburst or Sakuri, they have button suppressing their interface to just override it and say, I want things to cache in the browser for two days or 30 days or whatever. Um, so that's pretty easy. If you want to get more advanced, these are the tools that I look at and uh, I use. For full page caching, we use the Backcache WordPress plugin, or we use Varnish, which is a totally separate uh, software that you would install on the server, but it's the absolute fastest, most configurable caching uh, setup you can get. For object caching, there's a WordPress plugin that integrates with Redis. I would use Redis installed on the server. CDN, Cloudflare, and Sakuri uh, really work great for all, all your needs. There's a ton of different CDN providers out there. You can find one that matches uh, what you need. And for browser caching, the uh, general way you would set this up is you would use Nginx or Apache to define specific headers for when the site loads and tells your browser how long can it cache this, uh, this asset for. And there's lots and lots of tutorials and online for how to set that up. All right, so the key takeaways here. <clears throat> so the definition for caching is storing information in an easy to access location to be used later. The data we can store here is the results of queries or API calls and object caching. We can store the entire HTML page, or full page caching. Or we can store images and JavaScript files, any media assets that might be served from your site. That's the CDN or browser caching. So if you're going to get started somewhere, start with full page caching. That's going to have the absolute maximum impact of any of <coughs> caching options. Uh, in terms of speed and scalability, and it's also one of the easiest to install and configure and get started with. Uh, the second one I think is important. If you have a problem with the caching, it's not actually very likely that it's the caching plugin's fault or problem. Most of the popular caching plugins for WordPress work really well. There's probably a plugin or something in your theme or some other code that's doing something wrong that is causing that problem. So if you're like, ah, I installed caching and it doesn't work and there must be something wrong with the caching plugin, it's probably good to take a look at your site to try to really figure out what's actually going on and not just blame the caching plugin and turn it off. There are some caching plugins out there that try to do 800 things and it's like, I installed it and now there's 20 different <coughs> setting screens with 800 buttons, and I don't know which button to push. If you're not sure what to do, get rid of that one and try a different plugin. There's simpler ones 
I really like in WordPress to find a plugin that does the one thing I want to do and does it efficiently without many options or settings. Uh, so if WP Supercache has too many options and isn't working kind of on the default, there's a plugin called Hypercache that's even uh, simpler than that. And I think there's plugins that are even more simpler than Hypercache for uh, full page caching. So if you don't like it and you're finding it confusing and don't like the documentation, try a different plugin. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them that are really good. Uh, and it's important to find something simple that you're confident in, that you know is doing just the thing you want it to do. And this is my advice for all WordPress plugins, really. Try to find something that's focused on doing what you want to solve and isn't the kitchen sink uh, approach. All right. So this is me. My slides are going to be up there. And thank you for coming and attempting to stay awake. I heard on about caching. <laughs>
Yeah, they yeah. are. I'm not sure. I think the 
local, like local by flywheel they're putting here, I think has caching available. They gotta ask them about that, but having a development environment where you can play with caching and see how it works really helps. Um, it makes it easier because you end up at a place where your site works with caching and you don't have to go like right with it. Uh, and for the most part, most sites should be very compatible with full page caching. Things that could screw this up are if you're doing database writes or collecting data on the front end of a site. Specifically, I see this when there's sites that have some plugin that is, you know, tracking 404s or tracking user data uh, when they, they come to your site. I would use an analytics platform for that. I wouldn't use WordPress. With WordPress, then you can just cache the page and not write it to the database. And that's where you get into scaling. For the most part, for what most people I see using WordPress do to publish contents, uh, full page caching is going to work. It can be a fairly simple thing to enable and, and make work. Uh, again, do you have a question? Well, you, uh, sometimes I get this message on WordPress that do you want to delete your tasks on the dashboard? And I'm never sure should I delete it or what's the I'm not sure. That's a good question. Do you know what kind of caching plugin you're no. using or anything like that? So generally the times you would want to delete your cache is if you did something like, I published an article and for some reason I can't see it when I visit my site. Possibly there's a thing that has gone wrong with caching. If I cleared the cache, the old version would go away and now it would load everything fresh. I, don't think that in most cases there's no reason you would ever need to clear your cache. All the programming should just do its thing and work fine and leave it alone. If you get into a situation like that and there's some weird thing going on, sure, clearing the cache is a good thing to try to see if, well, maybe that'll fix it. Like, you know, we'll turn it off and turn it back on again. Maybe something weird happened and that'll clear it out. Uh, yeah. so yeah, so by developing the customized plugins, so is it a good practice to maintain a cache or like uh, handling the cache for global? What is the best practice while doing a customized plugins? Okay, for doing custom plugins, what's the best practice? Well, don't make writes to the database, right? Do reads and show your content and don't log stuff unless you're doing a plugin that's like WordPress comments or a form or something. Um, if you look in, at the WordPress codex, uh, there's a lot of documentation about how to leverage um, object caching. And there's some simple calls in WordPress when you're doing this development that you can say, okay, uh, we're building this whatever widget for most popular content, right? So when you do the database calls to figure out all these things, you can then cache the results, and it's really easy because WordPress gives you a function. You can say basically cache the results of all this stuff and cache it for this log. And so you can build that into the plugin uh, that you're, you're building. Anywhere you have something like expensive going on, you can build that in. And if you don't have caching, if there's no caching going on on the site, they don't have caching enabled. It doesn't matter, it just won't do that. It'll just keep doing the database query and you know it'll just ignore that. But if they do have caching, it'll start using it and they can take advantage of it. But there's there are some good resources out there on, on the WordPress codex. Um, the agency I work for, Ten Up, on Ten uh, we research Ten Up Engineering Best Practices. We talk a lot about it in our best practices, which are open source available for anyone to read. Um, yeah, that's where I start. Yeah. So um, then if you have a site with, um, where every single page either has a, a place to comment or like a MailChimp sign up, you, um, full page caching is not applicable? Not necessarily. Uh, it depends how the commenting is set up and your forms are set up. In general, a form submission, if it's a form, put in your content, click the button, it submits a post request to the server with all that that data, and you get like a thanks for submitting uh, kind of thing or, or some sort of feedback. Oftentimes, those are built either with JavaScript, um, 
when it's a post request, that's not going to be cached. Most of the time, stuff like that with comments or just a like a newsletter sign up is actually cache uh, cacheable. Um, it depends on how it's built. It depends on the comment system, but the WordPress built-in comments should be very compatible with full page caching and be fine. Um, and most of the email forms uh, should be should be fine as well because you don't get a it doesn't change the experience that every user is basically going to be served with the form, uh, and they're they're usually okay with that. It's definitely something you would want to kind of like if you have no caching and you're enabling it. Those are exactly the things I would test right away, right? If you make any caching changes, like test those things and make sure somebody else feel like it works and you're not getting the wrong uh, answer. I think all these people pointing at the wrists means time is up, right? <laughs> okay. All right, thank you.